But when uh, one of my, uh, in one of the debates, one of the Sangh Parivar activists told me that uh, if you go on like this, uh, your head will not, won't be there. Uh, so <laughs> I told him that if you take my head, you must eat it, because animals uh, uh, eat or when they kill, <laughs> but you can't <laughs> kill without <laughs> eating. Anyway, connecting with uh, 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 Shukla as such, there's one thing which is very important. The entire debate on uh, climate change is uh, also that uh, people have been protecting forests for ages. Adivasis have been protecting forests. And fisher folk have been uh, protecting the sea in a major way uh, in terms of natural resources and all that. Uh, agricultural traditional farmers have been looking after very well. And uh, what the changes have taken place in this history is also development. And you look at, uh, uh, when you look at Kodangalam before climate change to Kodangalam, I would like to connect connecting link. 28% of the emissions uh, are coming from energy sector, actually, you know. And uh, around 75% of the emissions are coming from uh, energy, agriculture, and industry. Destructive energy production, destructive agriculture, and destructive uh, industrial production, 75%. Rest, you can say, lifestyle. And the lifestyle is also dictated by the corporate world. What to uh, use, what fridge to uh, use, and what cars to make, uh, think all the flights and all that. Kind of, that's also the, that's also corporate control, actually. Lifestyle is dictated. You know, you, if you say that climate change can be dealt by if you changing your lifestyle, it doesn't make any sense at all. It's an entirely development, you know. So uh, the whole session on uh, disaster of development has already been witnessed in many places all over the world. Uh, lessons have been learned, but the politicians have to learn the lessons. Uh, Kulungulam is a wonderful lesson. Uh, all over the world, people have been backing out from nuclear plants. Germany has backed out. Japan has backed out. And many countries have backed out. In the United States, it's difficult to create a nuclear plant. So uh, uh, it's in this context that uh, their unwanted technology is coming to India, and Kodungalam struggle is a very inspiring struggle. Uh, we have uh, uh, Shikla Sen here, uh, who is part of the Coalition for Nuclear Disarmament and Peace, uh, who has been actively involved in the nuclear issues. I will uh, pass on the mic to him to continue the uh, discussion on this uh, development uh, paradigm and the disaster development as such. Yeah, first let me clarify one thing, why I am here. I am here primarily because for some reason or other the maker of the last film on Kudankulam, Amudan could not make it. Can you hear Se it? Can you hear it? Okay. Secondly, I am here not because I am a filmmaker or a film buff, I am neither, but I am associated with the issues the f these films have dealt with for donkey's years. Having said that, I will make a few short points under three categories. First, general point. It is probably 20th of March 2003 that the US under Bush launched its war against Iraq. If my memory serves me right, on 15th of preceding February, millions marched throughout the world of course, India was not a, within the loop. That's a different issue altogether. And uh, the, under the banner, not in my name. The next day, the New York Times came out with, a, came out with an editorial branding the protesting people as the sup second superpower of the world. That's the first general point. The second point, so far as the ecology is concerned, I'd like to share a few understanding of mine. The arts ecology essentially, to my mind, serves two functions. One, it is a huge reservoir of resources, including minerals, which also includes hydrocarbons, that means petroleum, also sweet water, stuff like that, and also uh, 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 living things like trees, fish, cattle, etc., etc. Some of these resources are virtually non-renewable. Some of these resources are renewable at a certain rate. 
the second function that it uh, it uh, discharges is it is also a vast sink it absorbs the waste products that is gaseous liquid and solid waste products but it has its it can also renew itself to a certain extent at a certain rate before the advent of the industrial civilization or capitalism if we like to call it that way human economy used to grow at a simple rate by the very nature of the capitalist economy it started growing at a compound rate so what is the implication if the economy global economy grows at the rate of 3% which actually it grew over the last few decades then it grows twice in size in less than 25 years that means in 25 years it it becomes twice in 50 years it becomes four times it 100 years it becomes 16 times and in 200 years it becomes 256 times so accordingly the amount of resources we go on extracting the rate and the rate at which we keep on dumping the waste that uh, uh, that actually skyrockets the arts ecology cannot take that much of assault it's as simple as that the woman protagon protagonist on uh, pradeep shah's film she said that art will collapse i beg to differ the art will not collapse its ecology will collapse and the ecology that sustains humanity and also life in general uh, because of the irreparable damage done to it the humanity will become extinct and probably life in general the other point related to ecology there is essentially three types of discriminations going on one between the global north and the global south global north stands for the developed countries and global south stands for the less lesser developed and underdeveloped countries now the global north extracts the resources at a much higher rate and dumps waste at a much higher rate the global south suffers even more because of its geographical location even without taking a proportionate part in that loot the second discrimination is within a country between the rich and the poor the rich extracts more consumes more and dumps more the poor have less adaptive capacity the poor suffers more the third thing the current generation and the future generation the current generation is exploiting the ecology and it is making unlivable for the future generation so there is a third dimension of the discrimination that is so far as the ecology is concerned so far as nuclear power is concerned as on date it is in general an economic so far as the, the pricing is concerned it is highly controversial even then it is generally recognized that it is an economic as compared to coal there is no controversy whether it is an economic as compared to gas or whether it is an economic as compared to wind energy there are controversies i am not going to that the second point is this it is intrinsically hazardous because it handles radioactive matters and there is no safe way of depositing the wastes which remain the nuclear waste which is produced in the process which remains radioactive for thousands and thousands of years so it is simply impossible to keep it in a safe manner the third thing is this it is potentially catastrophic we have seen in case of chernobyl which happened on 26th april 1986 in in then ussr in ukraine bordering belarus as per one there are there is again controversy on the number of deaths but as per one study done by one sci russian scientist yablokov 1 million people have died all over the world as a consequence of that accident the who figure is of course around 4000 or so but the who is actually tied up with the nuclear industry so anyway so that's one part the second part is this fukushima even before chernobyl there 1979 three mile island happened in usa 
but that did not go out of hand, that did not uh, cause the, uh, any comparable damage. In F uh, Fukushima, we had the accident on 11th of March 2011. So far, the globe is concerned, the nuclear energy is on the decline. Uh, as a whole, on the decline, uh, its uh, share in electricity production has gone down, the number of b b b nuclear reactors have gone down, etc., etc. I'm not going into the figures, we can go into that later. So far as India is concerned, as of now, at right at the moment, it is producing 1.8% of its electricity from nuclear sources. It has got a, right at the moment, it is uh, 4.8 gigawatt capacity for the nuclear power. And we have a program by 2020, it is going to be 20 gigawatt impossible program but uh, leave aside that there is a plan to have it 20 gigawatt of electricity produced by nuclear power plants and by 2032 it is going to be 63 gigawatt as per plan these plans have always flunked this will also flunk that's a different issue altogether but these have got disastrous implications so i'll right now stop at that uh, open the house or rather hand over to Sashi.